is the news. This is the news, and you're on Breakthrough. I'm Eugene Perrier. And I'm Monica Cruz. We're here this week, just like every week, bringing you some of the most critical news and perspectives and stories you're not going to hear anywhere else. That's absolutely true. We've got amazing things for you here. But real quick, we want to ask everyone who is watching right now, take a second, hit the share button on whatever platform you are watching so that anyone who follows you also gets a chance to see the great show that we have coming up today. And we're all around the world, as we always are, covering the COVID-19 crisis in Brazil, city council protest demanding an end to police terror in Denver, Colorado, the ongoing issues really around the country with this uprising against racism. Juneteenth, of course, was last week, and that very important holiday for Black America was the marker for many, many large protests that took place around the country. So we'll also be talking about that, as well as a very important action that took place on the part of the labor movement in Seattle also in relationship to this uprising around racism. So a lot of great, interesting stuff. So once again, take this time hit that share button, let everyone who follows you follow us here on Breakthrough. But before we jump into some of those stories, we're going to go back to Monica for some headlines. In many countries across the globe, the pandemic and shutdown have not caused mass unemployment because their governments provided full paycheck protection. Of course, not here where the U.S. government's failings have left tens of millions of unemployed workers. But to defect the blame, the Trump administration is resorting to the classic anti-immigrant scapegoating. On Monday, President Trump signed an executive order extending a ban on green cards for certain foreign workers until the end of the year. The ban also includes a freeze on H-1B visas, which are widely used by tech workers, H-2B visas for non-agricultural seasonal workers, J-1 visas for cultural exchanges, and L-1 visas for managers and other key employees of multinational corporations. The Trump administration claims these measures will open 525,000 jobs for non-immigrants. The measure comes a few days after the Supreme Court struck down the administration's effort to overturn DACA protections for immigrant youth. The repression of Bolivia's popular movement for socialism party, or MAS, continues under the right-wing coup government led by Janine Añez. MAS senatorial candidate Lucy Escobar and leaders Remy Fernandez and Osvaldo Gareca were actually arrested for transporting masks, eucalyptus plants, and other aid to the poor and working class neighborhoods of Cochabamba, according to their lawyer. Witnesses say that the police violently attacked them, and protests have erupted in the city demanding that three, these three leaders be released. And these very same neighborhoods are some of the hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, which organizers say the Añez government has weaponized by neglecting care and leftist strongholds. And in Seattle, Mayor Jenny Durkin announced that the city will disband the Police Free Autonomous Zone Capitol Hill Organized Protest, or CHOP. The zone includes the SPD East Precinct, which was abandoned by the cops and taken over by protesters during the ongoing protests demanding an end to racist policing. Durkin says the police will not be used to clear the zone, but instead city officials will work with community groups and ask people to leave voluntarily at night. Protesters have largely blocked law enforcement from entering the East Pine Street and Cal Anderson Park area for almost two weeks. And turning to Palestine, where thousands of Palestinians rallied on Monday against Israel's planned annexation of areas of the West Bank. Israeli forces blocked many busloads of protesters from attending the rally, which took place in Jericho. While Israel retains the full backing of the U.S. government, its biggest financial and military sponsor, the planned annexation has been met with worldwide condemnation. Especially notable was the participation in the rally of the UN envoy to the Middle East, as well as ambassadors from Russia, China, the EU, and Jordan. While mass protests have already taken place inside of Palestine, if Israel persists persist in this course of action, observers expect a new wave of armed resistance to take off. A member of Fatah's Central Committee declared, if there will be annexation, we won't suffer alone and we won't die alone. And as the pandemic continues, poor and working class Americans are facing a severe water affordability crisis. 
This is on top of the water quality crisis that is already ravaging many cities from Flint to Newark. A New Guardian investigation of 12 major American cities has found that the combined price of water and sewage increased by an average of 80 percent between 2010 and 2018, leaving millions of people potentially unable to afford the most basic of things, water, here in the richest country in the world. While some states pa passed shutoff moratoriums during the pandemic, many of these are set to expire, and only a few states agreed to reconnect the water during the pandemic for those who had already been shut off. The coronavirus pandemic continues to expose the absolute ineptitude and recklessness of right-wing governments across the world. Here's what President Trump had to say earlier this week about coronavirus testing. You know, testing is a double-edged sword. We've tested now 25 million people. It's probably 20 million people more than anybody else. Germany's done a lot. Uh, South Korea's done a lot. They called me, they said, the job you're doing, here's the bad part. When you test, a, when you do testing to that extent, you're gonna find more people, you're gonna find more cases. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. And not to be outdone, far right-wing President Jar Bolsonaro of Brazil was ordered by a court to wear a mask this week. And now Brazil is actually trailing the United States with the second highest rate of infections of coronavirus globally. President Bolsonaro has fired two ministers of health since the start of the pandemic. And similar to Trump's denial, he was calling the coronavirus just a common cold or flu. Now we are seeing the pandemic ravage some of the poorest communities in Brazil, indigenous communities, majority black communities, all facing the brunt of this crisis. And all the while, the federal government has not done much to step in, leaving it up to state and local officials to handle the pandemic on their own. We're excited to speak with Bravigo Durao of Brazil de Fato, writer and editor who will speak with us about the political crisis and public health crisis in Brazil. So welcome, Rodrigo. The first question we have, Brazil is set to surpass the U.S. as the nation with the highest rate of coronavirus infections, as I mentioned, and similar to how Trump initially downplayed it, President Bolsonaro has received a lot of fire over the months for just calling it a, quote, little flu and rejecting the WHO's guidelines on social distancing and wearing masks. Now we're seeing the poorest communities get hit the hardest. Can you describe what has led to the situation in Brazil? We could say there are a number of factors that are responsible for the situation. First, Bolsonaro's alignment to other right-wing governments, especially Donald Trump, but also uh, his tendency to despise science and global institutions such as the World Health Organization. To understand uh, the Bolsonaro's government, you have to keep in mind that he needs to have enemies in order to unite his supporters and scholars and scientists were chosen as the enemies. But this government is also against minorities and the most vulnerable people, sectors of society in the country. Unfortunately, unfortunately the sectors are, the, are not receiving the help they need right now. The lethality of the COVID among uh, indigenous people, for example, is more than twice bigger than compared to the rest of Brazilian society. Many are saying that Bolsonaro has attempted to make a political game out of the pandemic, like when he fired former public health minister Luiz Henrique Mandetta for urging Brazilians to social distance and stay indoors. What are your thoughts on this? The political and health crisis they grow bigger by the minute. Since the beginning of the outbreak, we had not one, but two health ministers sacked by Bolsonaro. And right now, we don't even have a health minister since mid-May, more than one month ago. What we have is uh, an interim person in charge of the health for the country, a military person, a general, that has not the knowledge enough for doing the job. And at the same time, Bolsonaro is trying to blame governors and mayors for the crisis, 
both the health crisis and the economic one that is uh, likely to get really worse uh, in the near future with a lot of unemployment. I believe, I personally believe that this is an attempt to control the, the narrative with an eye for the presidential elections that are due to take place in two years' time, in 2022. And have Brazilians been looking to any other countries who have done a better job at handling the pandemic and comparing that to what the government of Brazil should be doing in this time? It seems the pandemic has really um, made it ripe for people to make these kind of comparisons because it's exposing so much of the character um, of each government in dealing with this pandemic and why some countries have been far worse off than others. People are lost in the middle of conflicting information that comes from the government. And as a result, the situation is worse. Right now, the most reliable uh, statistics about the disease, they come from a joint effort from different media outlets, different uh, newspapers and televisions that compile numbers that come from very different sources because the numbers given by the government are not considered good enough. Yesterday, for example, the, um, the director of the World Health Organization said the number, the total number of cases in Brazil could be even three times bigger than we think. And uh, this, is, this, uh, this happens because we don't test enough people in Brazil, according to the World Health Organization. And under that light, we could have um, about 3 million cases right now in Brazil and more than 150,000 deaths. Absolutely jarring. Now, how have grassroots community organizers and movements for social justice in Brazil responded Well, at the same time that the Black Lives Matter protests, they, they, they started around the world, Brazilians took the streets of major cities to protest against Bolsonaro's government. What unites uh, the Brazilian protests against Bolsonaro is the will to defend democracy against what they seem, what they seen as the rise of fascism. Right now, one important movement is the one that asks for Bolsonaro's impeachment. There are many bills submitted um, to the Congress to, 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 for, for the impeachment, but they are uh, waiting for political will to go ahead. So the pressure is mounting. Well, thank you so much, Rodrigo, writer and editor with Brazil De Fato, for joining us today. Well, I'd like to thank our viewers once again for tuning in to our show and for tuning in every Wednesday, if you have been, for sharing, following, liking our content. We really appreciate all of that support. And I'd like to talk to you about one really critical way you can help keep our work going here at Breakthrough, and that's by becoming a patron of Breakthrough News. Check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash Breakthrough News. You'll see we have three different tiers of giving. All of them give you access to our exclusive monthly podcasts. $25 and $100 a month will give you access to our bi-weekly newsletter, what we're reading, and a host of other exclusive content and, and goodies. So please be sure to check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash Breakthrough News. If you feel so inclined, help us continue to be the media arm of the movement here at Breakthrough. Well, in the context of the mass uprising that is sweeping this country, demanding an end to police terror and racism, one of the major foci of protesters has been the role of police unions that always push the worst, certainly the most unaccountable, uh, unaccountable and certainly the most murderous policies uh, of police officers that we see. Their role is under fire in many cities around the country, but notably in Seattle, where the Labor Council, the Martin Luther King 
Junior Labor Council actually voted on June 17th to expel the Seattle police from the broader labor body. That's the governing body for all labor unions in the Seattle area. So a major action, one that is being discussed now by more and more labor figures. The head of SEIU, the nation's largest union, Mary Kay Henry, in fact said that this issue needed to be looked at. So the actions in Seattle, perhaps portending many similar actions by labor unions across the country. We shall see. But nevertheless, as it concerns the action of the MLK Labor Council in Seattle, we were very happy to be able to interview Nicole Grant a little earlier this week. She's the executive secretary of the MLK Labor Council in Seattle. And we are very honored as we continue the show to be joined by Nicole Grant, who's the executive secretary treasurer of the MLK Labor Council. That's King County. It's the Seattle and near environs. For those of you who don't know, Nicole, thank you so much for being with us here on the show. Thank you, Eugene. It's my pleasure to be with you and to be with your viewers. You know, the action that you all took on the council voting to remove the Seattle Police Union made a lot of news around the world. Uh, I mean, there's so much going on now, but I just wanted to ask, I mean, what was it that moved uh, the members of the council to take a step like this? I mean, you could have done something much more symbolic, I'm sure, but to do something this substantive, what led you here? Black Seattle. Seattle has a black community that is leading in this moment and is leading with its youth. And we were asked by leaders in movements like the Black Lives Matter movement and others if we would remove SPOG from our labor council. And the way it was put to us in a petition that was supported by leaders, but that was also signed by over a thousand black union members was that we will not and cannot be in an organization that includes our killers. It is us or them. And we chose our future. We chose black workers, black union members. Uh, so where does this action fit in the broader vision of the council about labor's role in the fight for racial justice, the fight for black lives? We're a quality of life movement. And our main purpose is to make sure that the people that make our cities go, people like teachers, bus drivers, construction workers, is to make sure that workers have a good life. And you cannot have a good life when you're attached to racism. And so this was a choice that we made for workers. And we think that it's very important in order for the labor movement to stay relevant and modern, for us to represent black union members, but also to recruit young people into the labor movement, we have to do the right thing. What are some of the things that you maybe are looking forward to or, or is developing um, either out of the council or in partnership with others? Policing and institutional racism in policing are very top of mind and we plan on working with community in that area. But it is by no means the only place where, where racism is exerting itself. We have had a massive influx of um, population and wealth in our community. And it has uh, been very hard to keep Seattle fair and to keep Seattle anti-racist when we have corporations like Amazon, for instance, that come to Seattle who in any statistically significant way will not hire black software developers, Latinx software developers, women software developers. There are so few diverse faces in these corporations that are completely dominating the political landscape of our city in everything from housing cost to accessibility to wages and good jobs. And that's a place that we're willing to fight as well.
We care about people's lives. I mean, what we want for workers, which is basically everybody, is for people to be living their absolute best life. We want people to be well paid, respected. We want them to have fairness, but we want them to have pleasure, joy. And so I think that taking a holistic attitude and expanding our community through the best allyship we can really will. I mean, what we, you know, we've sown it, but what we're trying to reap is the best lives imaginable for people, for their health, for their education, for their recreation. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we can do some real work to change the nightmare scenario of racism in the United States and have a good foundation, not the foundation that our country has, which is the foundation of slavery, but a fair economic foundation, then we can, we can build a, a beautiful garden, you know, where we all, where we all flourish together. Last Friday was Juneteenth, the 19th of June. This is a long running holiday in the black community here in the United States that this year really uh, went viral, as they say. The holiday is related to the hearing of some slaves in Texas about the Emancipation Proclamation and their own freedom. And it became a national holiday, a symbol of the black liberation movement after the Poor People's March on Washington in 1968. On Juneteenth that year, there was a large mass march of course, Dr. Martin Luther King had just been killed. So it was a huge march commemorating his memory and his legacy. And from there, people took Juneteenth back all around the country and it became an institution in so many different places. And this year, in the context of the uprising that has been sweeping this country, the rebellion that's been rocking the nation, uh, revolt against racism, uh, as we've said a few times before on this show, Juneteenth took on a new significance in many different ways from calls for it to be a national holiday, some companies giving people a paid holiday, to, of course, uh, quite a number of protests around the country looking to use this day to continue to elevate the cause of black liberation and the fight for freedom amongst black people and all those who sympathize with the cause uh, of, uh, of the community moving forward. So we wanted to give you some sense of what took place over the weekend with this roundup here. It was one of more than 90 organized events yesterday in New York City and one of hundreds taking place across the country. In cities like San Francisco, Seattle, New Orleans, and Orlando, the events called for America to reconcile with its racism and institutional discrimination against people of color. While events varied across the country, some returned the focus to statues that commemorate long-standing symbols of the country's oppressive past. In Raleigh, North Carolina, after a day of marching, protesters pulled down two statues of Confederate soldiers. In Washington, D.C., police didn't intervene when protesters toppled and burned a statue of Confederate General Albert Pike prompting President Trump to tweet, these people should be immediately arrested, a disgrace to our country. And in New York, marchers surrounded a statue of Christopher Columbus, which was heavily guarded by police to prevent any attempt to topple it. Demands to remove statues and protests against racism and police brutality also continued overseas today. In Edinburgh, protesters gathered at the statue of Henry Dundas, a Scottish politician who played a large role in delaying the end of Britain's slave trade. In Paris, hundreds gathered in the streets, and in London, thousands of protesters marched for the fourth consecutive week, despite a ban on large gatherings to prevent the spread of coronavirus. Well, obviously, ongoing activity there all around the country, all around the world. I think it's worth noting that this is a worldwide movement. Uh, you know, we've obviously talked about it here on the show many different times. But even, you know, the mention that we had from our earlier interview with the, the, the gentleman from Brazil, DeFato, laying out how when the Black Lives Matter protests were erupting here in the United States, people were taking the streets in Brazil. And there were some similar issues there um, uh, as well and some cross-pollination that's happened. So, uh, you know, I think that's, you know, one notable piece of this. I think as we've talked about so many times on the show before, the fact that Juneteenth, which in many ways was a holiday that was basically obscure to people who are not black uh, or, you know, deeply in tune with the black community, has become such a cultural touchstone so quickly, I think speaks very significantly to the depth of this movement and how much it has really shaken the foundations of the country, shifted opinion in some ways. And even in those it hasn't shifted opinion and just by evoking these unbelievable racist reactions, uh, by bringing in these individuals who don't want to do anything at the political level, but at least want to co-opt it 
and I can say more about that later, but I, you know, just to mention it, I think all of those things in train are a real sign that this is not something that's just gonna die down, that this is a real significant movement in a serious sense. It's social, it's cultural, it's got a protest element, um, but really this is not something that I think, I think people are waiting to wake up one day and for it to be over. And I, I think the genie is out of the bottle on that. I don't think that's gonna happen. I think it's taking more and more forms and becoming more interesting in the ways that uh, it's touching different aspects of society, but nevertheless, I don't think it's over. Right, and I think just the symbolism of seeing all of these statues of racist slave owners, all of this, not only here in the United States, but around the globe being pulled down, um, all of this celebration for removing um, these symbols of black oppression, um, of chattel slavery, it's just very clear that, that this movement is not going to die down, and people are not going to settle for just seeing um, a couple of killer cops get arrested or a couple of reforms be introduced at the city and state levels, those same reforms we talked about last week that have not worked. And I think um, the further symbolism of all these statues, not only the, the fact that the anti-black racism, the anti-white supremacist movement is one that is global, but also it really goes to show that the very foundation of the United States, the very foundation of countries like France, like Germany, we talked with this black activist in Berlin a couple weeks ago, right? The foundation um, of all of these institutions, of the education system that didn't teach us about Juneteenth, all of these things, is rooted in the oppression of black people, right? So this issue of the statues, I think, speaks to the larger, um, the larger, I think, uh, real clear uh, feeling of this moment and of this movement that we have to address systemic racism on every single level. And spray painting or chalking down Black Lives Matter, whatever, ever um, down the main street in DC all of these like just kind of like liberal symbols of anti-racist um, movement making it's not going to stifle this movement it's not going to appease people because people are really starting to see that the very foundation of this for-profit system here in the US and in countries like it all over the world with this uh, history of slavery and colonialism we're understanding that this is the root of the issue and we cannot um, talk about all these different issues as if they're separate well speaking of dc speaking of taking down statues speaking of hypocritical politicians that are saying one thing and doing another we will turn to the district of columbia now uh now as you mentioned monica and as many people have talked about since the Black Lives Matter Plaza has been set up, there's been quite a bit of controversy over the issue because Mayor Muriel Bowser is one of the most pro-police mayors out there. She has one of the most you know, disgusting police chiefs, someone who has a history of domestic violence uh, in his own past, someone who is a inveterate defender of police who kill people. So it just seemed massively hypocritical for her to be doing this. Uh, it wasn't really hypocritical. I mean, it was hypocritical, but it was political, right? Like she knew it was being hypocritical. So nevertheless, over the course of this weekend, a lot of these controversies contradictions came to a head. And in the, for people who don't know Washington, D.C. and where this Black Lives Matter Plaza is, just to sort of lay this out so people understand what's going on here. So the Black Lives Matter is laid out on a part of 16th Street that leads into Lafayette Park, which is a park that is, many people consider it the front of the White House, technically the back of the White House. In the middle of that park, there is a giant statue, uh, not of Lafayette, as you might expect, actually, right, for your Revolutionary War history, but of Andrew Jackson. So this is, of course, Andrew Jackson of many negative things that could be said, but perhaps most notably is one of the, you know, great, and I don't mean great in a good way, but great in scale, uh, genocidaires of the United States, really. Um, the Trail of Tears, that's Andrew Jackson. The Attack on the Seminole Indians in, in Florida, that's Andrew Jackson. So, I mean, a huge piece of the really wiping out of the Native American population in the southeastern part of the United States. Why? In order to clear the ground for slavery, because there was a lot of speculation. They wanted this land. They wanted to bring in more slaves and grow these profitable crops. So I say all that just to lay this out, because I think that context is important. What happened here in terms of seeing that the true hypocrisy that's at stake here, because Muriel Bowser, others, they say, oh, we're for good protests. We want all that. We're against racism. So Saturday, there was an attempt to bring down the Andrew Jackson statue in Lafayette Park. It did not succeed because the Metropolitan Police, who are controlled, of course, by the city, and the Park Police, that's a federal agency, but they often work in conjunction, decided to protect the statue of this, you know, genociding president and push people violently out of the park. And we have some video 
uh, of what took place there uh, in Washington over the weekend, and then we can say a little bit more. Lafayette Square. Now, protesters obviously felt attacked, and when the police moved in, they got to the statue of Andrew Jackson. People climbed onto the statue, which is within inside of the White House. They tied ropes to it before trying to tug it down. Now, our crews even saw people chiseling away at the feet of the statue, trying to break it loose. Federal police and D.C. police, though, responded and not in a, a, a peaceful manner. They used uh, crowd control tactics to remove it. We have video of police pepper spraying a protester, and eventually police pushed the protesters out of the park. Now that turned into several hours of an intense standoff with police. And we heard from people right after this for their account of what happened. That last one where you can see was actually a freeze frame of a pepper ball being shot at someone. Really unbelievable. It's slowed down image of it to see it, but these so-called non-lethal weapons at point blank range, um, you know, a little ridiculous. But yeah, this actually went on well into the night and into the early morning into Sunday. And the entire Black Lives Matter Plaza shortly after this was cleared by the police. They pushed protesters out of Black Lives Matter Plaza brutally. So you have the so-called uh, Black Lives Matter Plaza, which is supposed to be representing the movement against police brutality, being violently cleared, you you know, so be, by the use of police brutality in order to protect a statue of someone who was pro-slavery and played a major major role in the genocide of Native Americans. That's the work of the liberal mayor Muriel Bowser of Washington D.C. doing the work of Trump right there in lockstep. She might not be putting out the tweets about people taking down statues, but she's carrying out the policies. I mean, what what else is there to say? What it, an incredible um, just symbol and indication of what the state really stands for, what the role of the police really are to protect property, to protect these these statues celebrating um, the chattel slavery, the genocide of Native Americans here in the U.S. Um, and the hypocrisy of uh, of the D.C. mayor, the hypocrisy of um, all of these um, mayors and, and local politicians, state politicians across the country. I mean, here in New York City, uh, Governor Cuomo tweeting in support of the protests as the NYPD throws tear gas and beats protesters in the streets of this city. I mean, every single night um, for weeks since this massive movement has popped off. And I think that's something that is so uh, incredible about this particular resurgence in the anti-racist movement, because as I just said, we are seeing the connections between so many different issues, being able to trace um, modern day policing to um, its, its root, its establishment in keeping black people under control, in protecting the property of the slave owners, right? And um, I think uh, one thing that I was really um, blown away by was seeing all of the incredible uh, mobilizing that's been happening out in Long Island, actually one of the uh, most historically segregated places in this yes. country, a place, uh, you know, uh, something like the N uh, Nassau Police Department has a long track history, long track record of police brutality, of racist policing, um, and as well, of course, the prevalence of uh, white supremacist armed militias out in Long Island working hand in hand with the county police, right? So I wanna turn to a really powerful clip of an activist in Long Island at a speak out over the weekend, a speak out in March that happened where she talks about some of these different um, intersecting issues and how it relates to black liberation as a whole. We'll check that the out. The only way forward for the liberation of black people, where as a nation, we're able to determine our own destiny, not politicians and definitely not our oppressors. We need a new society entirely. Yep. A society that guarantees universal health care yep. and education. Yep. A, a society that makes a job and affordable housing a constitutional right. One that eliminates the systemic basis of a racist police state. Yep. And that's, that's not utopian. It's what the, the struggle will inevitably win. If we fought for centuries, what does liberation even mean? 
It is the political and economic emancipation from the tiny minority of the super rich white elite supremacists who control society. Slavery laid the financial basis for some of the richest institutions and families to exist to this very day. America herself was built off the backs of slave labor with their bare hands. And racism, racism is the tool that the elite class uses to keep us divided. Well, an incredible, incredible talk, incredible speech um, by this organizer yeah. out in Long Island. The thing that I first thought about when I watched that clip was, let's just bring it back to what, what ignited this movement, right? The killing of George Floyd. He was arrested for supposedly using a counterfeit $20 bill, right? He was recently unemployed, one of the, the 40 million plus Americans um, who lost their jobs since the start of the, this pandemic. And when we hear the speaker talk about all of these different intersecting issues, how it connects to black liberation, I, I can't help but think, you know, this movement is not fighting for someone like George Floyd to have been, you know, okay, we're saying do not kill us, right? We cannot breathe, but we're also not fighting for George Floyd to be locked up over a $20 counterfeit bill, ending up maybe like one of the, uh, the majority of inmates at Rikers Island right now who are just sitting there because they cannot afford bail, right? That could have been a situation George Floyd f um, found himself in. And uh, when we really talk about how this movement is taking on so many issues and connecting them, I think it's really because time and time again, we're not only seeing our people being killed with absolute impunity, but we are also seeing how issues like poverty, like homelessness, like lack of access to education and healthcare and jobs, all of these things um, are so directly related to the brutality and violence that we face under this system. And I would argue that poverty, joblessness, lack of access to healthcare, all these things are violence in themselves, um, but they are, are mere just uh, outcomes of the, the inherent violence of this system. And uh, just to throw out there, you know, the very fact that Wall Street was literally built on a mass grave of black slaves, of course, um, Manhattan, downtown Manhattan, that area being uh, one of the biggest slave ports um, here in the United States, right? So uh, again, um, it's really incredible to see how this movement is making these connections, is not settling for another liberal reform or small concession. Uh, we're really getting at the root of the problem here. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, a couple of things. You know, one, there's about 500,000 odd people who are in jail right now only because they cannot afford to get out of the United States. It's a massive, massive scandal, um, this so-called pretrial detention. But, I mean, you know, to, to the points that the speaker made, I, I think that really it's important for... It, we have to take a historical view of the point. I mean, you know, you look at the the, the the fact that you have the sort of law and order forces trying to crush the movement in the streets. You have the, uh, you know, liberal forces trying to co-opt the movement. I mean, to me, it really comes down to one thing. Like, what's the difference between a rebellion and a revolution? Rebellions usually are fight the good fight and revolutions win at the end of the day, right? Like, uh, without a doubt, we all venerate Nat Turner, or we should, um, and we all venerate Toussaint Louverture, and we should. Uh, but there's obviously a big difference between Nat Turner's revolt and the Haitian Revolution. And I think it's very clear what that difference is. And I think the context of this right now, and I think what, what you know, we saw in the clip earlier, I think for people out in the streets is, you know, knowing so clearly that there are forces that either want to misdirect you or want to just stop you cold using force, violence, laws, whatever they can, um, is there a third path? Will they take the third path? That's the historical third path. I think we've consistently seen when people's movements have decided that they're just not going to wait for someone to do something for them, but they're going to take you know, power for themselves and do the things that they want to see um, done without any sort of intermediary. And I think that it may sound grandiose, but when you look at 40 million people unemployed, a worldwide global pandemic that's killing hundreds of thousands of people that the government is doing nothing about, climate change, um, the continued uh, continuation of racism, at a certain point, you have to stop talking about why isn't anyone doing anything um, and what are we going to do to stop these things and what are we going to do to change it? And I think that's, you know, partially the moment that this is, is starting to run up against. Well, one of the main subplots, if you will, in official Washington and the political media over the last week or so has been what to make of the book written by former National Security Advisor 
John Bolton about his time there in the White House. The book is called The Room Where It Happened. And of course, any book by any prominent presidential insider released during a presidency is going to garner some attention. But Bolton's public feuding with Trump and his single-mindedness as a political operative meant that the book was bound to be very venal, very vindictive, and full of a lot of juicy tidbits about Trump's, about Trump's excuse me, completely absurd behavior. So Trump actually engaged in this, this you know, long process to actually block the book. So this is partially why this is coming up so recently. This book was actually supposed to come out a while ago. Trump has been trying to block the book. A judge basically said that the book should have been blocked, that there was quote unquote illegal information. If you work in the government, you're supposed to have the things clear, the books cleared, so there's no classified information. The judge said that it probably shouldn't go forward, but since they'd sent out hundreds of thousands of copies, there was nothing he could do, so it was gonna go forward. So Trump, of course, has been very upset about the book itself and about the nature of how it came out. Here's a taste of some of his recent comments. I think it's totally inappropriate that he does a book. I think uh, a guy, I gave him a break. Uh, he couldn't get Senate confirmed. He was never Senate confirmed the first time. I don't think he's supposed to even be calling himself an ambassador. In, in terms of Bolton, he broke the law. I, he was a washed up guy. I gave him a chance. Uh, he couldn't get Senate confirmed, so I gave him a non-Senate confirmed position where I could just put him there, see how he worked. And uh, I wasn't very enamored. He wasn't very enamored there, washed up. Uh, I mean, it's almost like a, a feud between the owner of the sports team and some star player, the way they're talking about each other, uh, which gives you a sense of the level of maturity of some of these people. But nevertheless, uh, the, the book is out. It's made this big issue. Trump is very upset. Of course, he also took to Twitter, as he often does, to rip John Bolton. Uh, he's actually been taking to Twitter quite a bit to rip John Bolton. But one of the tweets that made very notable news, this one here that's appearing alongside of me, calling John Bolton a wacko, saying the book is exceedingly tedious, or actually quoting the New York Times, it seems, saying it's exceedingly tedious, that there are lies, that there's fake stories, um, and so on and so forth. But this has been a major theme on Trump's Twitter account here, tweets just like this. And, you know, it's relatively understandable that Trump is very upset that this book is out there because, as I mentioned, it does not, in fact, present him in a flattering light. And Bolton's, you know, little tour that he's been doing to promote the book, he's been making quite clear uh, the negative view he's trying to push forward of Trump here. Here's some of Bolton's recent comments. You described the president as erratic, foolish, behaved irrationally, bizarrely. You can't leave him alone for a minute. He saw conspiracies behind rocks and was stunningly uninformed. He couldn't tell the difference between his personal interests and the country's interests. I don't think he's fit for office. I, I don't think he has the competence to carry out the job. There really isn't any guiding principle uh, that I was able to discern other than uh, what's good for Donald Trump's reelection. So, of course, hitting right there at President Trump's vanity and doing it there on ABC, but across many other platforms. So I, you know, I want to get into some of the book. But before we get into some of the nature of the book, we just have to take a quick step back and just note that, uh, I mean, these are two horrible people. It's a falling out amongst thieves. Everything they're saying about each other has to be taken at least with some grain of salt because of who we are dealing with. I mean, you just take Bolton, for example, here. Now, Bolton is someone who I'm pretty sure has never met a war, at least one that's for imperialism, that he has never liked. He has a decades-long career as a foreign policy hand in all parts of the government, supporting any bloodthirsty dictator or devastating invasion as long as it pushes the U.S. towards its this world policeman, world domination. I mean, that's really John Bolton's not only dream, but what he's worked his entire life to do. And in fact, and you know, this is an interesting element of it, Trump actually spoke to this shortly after, or well, not shortly after Bolton had been fired, shortly after the issue of the book started to pick up in a broader conversation. Trump told the Wall Street Journal a uh, really unbelievable quote here about why he picked Bolton. The only thing I liked about Bolton was that everyone thought he was crazy or everybody thought he was crazy. When you walk into the room with him, you're in a good negotiating position because they figure you're going to war if John Bolton is there. So obviously that gives you a sense of uh, John Bolton's career when every diplomat on the world stage considers his presence to be war, which by the way, when he was being confirmed, many diplomats on the world stage and other commentators were pointing out. Trump 
Of course, no, uh, you know, shrinking Violet when it comes to warmongering himself. According to Bolton's book, if it can be believed, he said that invading Venezuela would be cool. Uh, very alarmingly, the book said that Trump told him that he had privately given uh, Prime Minister of Israel, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, assurances that the United States would back uh, Israel if they went to war with Iran, which would obviously be speed massively, massively destructive, potentially millions of people dying, but that Trump was willing to get involved in that. And of course, he's put crushing sanctions on millions of people around the world trying to starve out any country perceived to be anti-American by Trump and his buddies in the Washington elite. So that's who we're dealing with here. And I think that's important as we go into it. But it's clear both parties don't mind getting their hands pretty bloody. So what's really at the root of all of this animosity? I think that's what's really notable if they're both big warmongers, right? Well, the excerpts from the book that have been out make it pretty clear that it's not so much that Bolton hates Trump because Trump isn't into war, just because Trump isn't into war enough for Bolton's liking. In fact, the major theme of the book seems to be that Bolton's sole goal was to stamp out any sign that of any sort of peace that could break out anywhere in the world at any time. For instance, uh, one of the things that came up and was discussed here was the issue of Iran. Now, on all these issues, it's worth noting that the book relays Trump has had multiple positions, but at one point, Trump was open to and wanting to meet with the leadership or some of the leadership of Iran. There were back channels that were going on um, from the foreign job uh, about the willingness of the Iranians to meet with Trump. So, you know, there was all sorts of things going on. Trump's telling his advisors, I want to meet this. But Bolton even says in the book at one point, a note was passed to him saying Trump really wants to do this. And then Bolton goes on to relay how he allied with, uh, of course, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who also, of course, wants to kill everyone in Iran if possible. And Benjamin Netanyahu, a foreign leader, now, remember now, this is the, everyone talking about, oh, Trump, foreign leaders, people should be meeting with foreign leaders. Here's Bolton saying that he's working with the Secretary of State and the Prime Minister of Israel to block the meeting to prevent, eventually, potentially have peace between Iran and the United States to potentially get some sort of deal to relieve the crushing sanctions that are you know, killing Iranian people and making life hard for some of them. That Bolton, what was he trying to do? Do everything possible to stop that. And also, on the issue of Venezuela, the same, actually the exact same uh, course of events. Bolton details how at one point Trump expressed a willingness to directly negotiate with President Maduro. Worth noting here um, on a number of fronts that at least according to uh, Bolton, Trump consistently acknowledged that President Maduro probably would not be overthrown, but you know, gives you a sense of how unbelievable these sanctions are in Venezuela, that they know it won't do anything, but uh, nevertheless, they continue to push forward and, and, and you know, inflict terrible pain on people. But nevertheless, at one point, because of the fact that really was clear to anyone who wanted to pay attention, that the United States would not in fact succeed in overthrowing the Venezuelan government, which has mass support amongst the people, that he said, I'm open to direct negotiations with Maduro. This time Netanyahu wasn't involved, but Netanyahu's place, Marco Rubio came in. The whole Florida delegation, by the way, was involved in this, Democrats and Republicans at some point or another, arrayed with Bolton, doing everything possible to prevent any sort of direct negotiations to maintain the suffocating sanctions on Venezuela. And also in addition to that, Bolton claimed to have worked to prevent President Trump from even having a private meeting with Kim Jong-un in the Hanoi summit. Didn't want him to have a private meeting because the fear amongst Bolton and I guess his ilk in there was that in fact, if the two leaders were able to meet you know, alone without all the aides, without all the warmongers like John Bolton, they may actually even to a deal. In fact, at one point, Bolton says Trump asked him a question. I think many millions of Americans are wondering, why are we sanctioning a country 7,000 miles away? And of course, Bolton came with some warlike stuff to, to you know, mollify Trump, but it just gives you a sense of the role he's playing. And let's just reiterate it. Bolton's main goal, and this is from his own mouth, I mean, this is what he's writing in the book, was to make sure that the most bellicose and most destructive U.S. policies abroad stayed in place. I mean, and that's really a hell of a record if you think about it, to be proudly stating your rock-ribbed resistance to critical medicines being delivered to children in Iran and Venezuela. That's John Bolton for you. But 
Of course, as these insider books always do, they have some interesting tidbits that are very relevant to how we understand what's going on in the world, and especially many of these U.S. imperialist plots. One thing I thought was particularly notable is Bolton mentioned that the U.S. military was directly involved in conjunction with USAID in the disastrous PR scandal that took place in Cucuta on the border between Venezuela and Colombia. You may remember this. This is where the Venezuelan opposition was trying to say that Maduro was torching the aid that they were trying to bring across. But as was reflected on social media in real time, and that even the New York Times has admitted at this point, in fact, the Venezuelan opposition torched their own trucks in an attempt to blame Maduro, but of course it fell apart while it was happening, it was easily exposed as a fraud, but the US military directly involved. Now remember this was supposedly some humanitarian operation, but anyway, US military directly involved. Obviously Bolton is hoping that Trump loses the election and that this book helps do that. It's clear that all of the stuff in there about China that has made the news in a major way about Trump's relations with, uh, with Xi Jinping are designed to help Joe Biden's presidential campaign. Joe Biden obviously is running a campaign. I mean, and Trump is also running this campaign. Both parties running a campaign to say the other side is weak on China. Bolton has now given Joe Biden's campaign quite a bit of information, some of which they've already used, by the way, saying that Trump is in fact weak on wanting to go to war, potentially nuclear war with China. But it's more than just a revenge plot because obviously that's on its surface, that's some of it. There's no doubt about it. But Bolton is certainly more clever than that. In fact, you know, when he was once confirmed or in a confirmation uh, in for a position in the Bush administration, Joe Biden, so you see how these characters often reemerge here, the elites, the same for 30, 40, 50 years, said that he was fearful of Bolton because Bolton was too effective at doing the things he wanted to do. And this book is a very effective piece because Bolton is situating his efforts within the broader liberal narrative of Trump is uh, dangerously eroding the norms of government. And Bolton is using that to launder his own positions by making his insane warmongering appear to be the actions of the adult in the room or a rational actor, as it were, then it makes it appear that what he's doing is, is right. And so he's able to take what are, are terrible, terrible policies. I mean, there are unimpeachable reasons why the U.S. should immediately lift sanctions on Venezuela, immediately lift all sanctions on Iran, try to make peace in the Korean Peninsula. I mean, when we get down to brass tacks, these are very defensible arguments. These are things that millions of people in this country would like to see, quite frankly, and that's been shown consistently, that people want to see this war machine rolled back in this country. But by associating these policies with bold letters, Trump, and attaching it to the liberal narrative of Trump taking the country down, it helps make more space in the mainstream for those views to be considered the right views, the anti-Trump views, the progressive views. So it's a very smart play that Bolton is putting together here with this book to put the warmongering policies that have been slipping away in this country. I mean, let's remember, regardless of what they did, both Obama and Trump ran on platforms of pulling back U.S. militarism abroad. Didn't do it, but they ran on it. And I think that's important to understand. Many politicians saying similar things here now, uh, Afghanistan, other things, everyone wants to be on board with pulling out, whether they are or whether they aren't. At the end of the day, we know many, many people reject the policies that John Bolton represents. He knows that many, many people reject the policies that John Bolton represents, and he's trying to find a way to reinsert into the political discourse the worst kind of warmongering. Thankfully, though, He's so shameless, it's 100% obvious. And my message to everyone out there watching is, don't fall for it. Well, on Monday night in Denver, a city council meeting public comment period was taken over by a large number of protesters who wanted to be heard on the issue of police terrorism, who spoke for quite some time. and. Many, many, many different people spoke. Really, some were the, the families of victims of police brutality, friends, and laying out many people who've been killed in Denver, the lack of action by the city authorities, and demanding an end to this state of affairs, demanding justice in a number of specific cases. Uh, really, a, a, a very interesting action for sure uh, in that city. And we were able to interview one of the organizers that helped put this event together, uh, Joel, actually, from the Party for Social and Liberation, which was at the spearhead of this action. Well, we are very honored to be joined here by Joel Ibrahim from the Party for Socialism and Liberation, who was there at the Denver City Council uh, during this action that took place recently. Joel, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Well, I, I just want to start here with sort of the reasoning for what took place. Why did people go 
to the city council meeting. Well, actually, since the uprising uh, really kicked off in Denver, people have been going to the city council meetings when like every week, uh, actually, as a matter of fact, um, basically just voice their opinions. Um, they've been really um, structured and formatted the way that like city council people and the people in the courthouse have been structuring them. Um, but last night, tonight, or last night, the energy was a lot different. Um, it was it was a lot different, and especially it sort of comes on uh, the heels of a recent announcement by the district attorney um, to not press charges against uh, a killer cop, a cop who killed a 21 year old William Debose just this past. Well, he killed him in uh, May, but she made the announcement on Thursday. Um, and so that Thursday, um, we, in the PSL, actually, we spearheaded uh, an action in response to that, that very day. Um, and, you know, it was good. We marched through the streets. We went to the DA's office. We had a good little rally and demonstration. Uh, we had the family uh, of William DeBose speak. Um, so it was pretty powerful. Um, but, you know, people, people wanted to keep the pressure on. So the energy was a lot different uh, this time. And uh, people really wanted to talk about not just this particular case. This DA has a history of letting killer cops walk. Uh, you know, she's a Democrat. She mm. claims to support Black Lives Matter. She lives in, you know, a rich white garrison community somewhere in Denver. Um, and I think people just have had enough of the hypocrisy and enough of, of them letting killer cops off the hook. Like in this moment, so many of these, especially Democratic mainstream establishment politicians are all like, I want to be about it. I'm all about it. You know, this is this is good. But in reality, it seems like they're the, these cities, these administrations are often some of the most complicit in pushing forward these 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 brutal police departments. Yeah. Not, I mean, not only are they are they complicit, they're 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 just bold faced lying to our faces. Um, uh, for example, when uh, when. The DA uh, made the announcement. She also released a, a video, like the body camera footage of the incident. And, you know, they wanted to use that footage as like exact proof that, oh, yeah, this was justified. But it's like you can't see anything in the video. You mm. see red circles, you see blurred footage, and you really don't see much. It looks doctored and it looks, you know, all you saw was red circles and things. And it was mm. like, oh, good. Yep, you deserved it. Case closed. Wow. Um, there was also, uh, before we even got into the city council meeting yesterday, we saw the family of Alexis Mendez outside. Alexis Mendez was a 16 year old and he was just running. He was running away from something, but it, but he was accused of burglary and some off duty corrections officer shot him in the back. Case closed. That was mm. it. There was no investigation. The DA just said, oh, well, burglary, that's it. No investigation, no nothing. Um, Denver police have a history of shooting people in the back while fleeing. That's one of the things that they do. And not even just Denver, but in Colorado Springs, which is about 40 minutes south of here, the same thing happened with Devon Bailey back in 2019. Shot in the back. Like, it's not even, it, and it's just so normalized here. And you have this Democratic district attorney that's like, oh, well, bummer. Mm. You know, that's it. And, um, and I think people have had enough. Um, and so we definitely saw enough yesterday when we took over that city council meeting. Denver is, I think, number five in police shootings of people. It's it's not, you know, people rarely think of Denver, but, uh, you know, it's it's definitely up there in terms of police killings of people. Uh, Denver has high rates of homelessness, of gentrification. Um, they've gutted social services in that city, and they've basically given almost a, a blank check to police. Policing is a huge part of the budget out here. There is something incredibly wrong with what's happening in this city. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that it's not even just, you know, the the overt police terrorism against the people, but homelessness and gentrification is also terror against the people. Um, so many people have been kicked out of their homes. I've I haven't I haven't seen so many like tent cities in, like in my entire life as I've seen in Denver. And yet mm. they're they're sweeping the tent cities, like they're going wow. through and they're destroying the tent cities and just relocating people and then sweeping those places. And just and this is this is what they're doing right now in the middle of a pandemic. Where does this go from here? I think obviously there's more energy and obviously it seems a, a renewed desire amongst a large number of people to keep pressing on these issues out there. Mm -hmm. Where does it go from here? I think that I think that people are are certainly gaining confidence. They're gaining the confidence that they can actually challenge power, that they can actually go and be in front of these people's faces. And we saw that last night. Like last night at the at the city council meeting, they tried to 
basically like have like a line of people out the door waiting mm -hmm. and inside of the chambers where the city council people were, there was like one person per pew. But then they were like, okay, we're going to put people in the overflow room. So mm -hmm. they said that, oh yeah, because of COVID, we're going to make sure everyone's spread out in this room, but y'all can go stuff yourselves in an overflow room. Right. And so we showed up and we just started agitating people in line to be like, hey, this is not right. We should go into the meeting. And so as soon as we started talking to people, somebody just started chanting, somebody, you know, and then we just walked right in. And then we said, we're taking over. This is our meeting now. Well, I think that is going to do it for what we have on the show this week, Monica. That's right. Thanks again to everyone tuning in. We're here every Wednesday at 8 p.m. If you haven't already, make sure to hit share, discuss breakthrough news with your friends, your family, your coworkers, everyone. Keep the important work um, that we're here doing. Um, spread to everybody. Follow us on social media, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook at BT Newsroom. Subscribe to our YouTube page where you will get immediate alerts as soon as we post new videos. And of course, if you're so inclined, to give and support the work that we're doing, keep us going. Become a patron, patreon.com slash breakthrough news, and you'll also be entitled to a ton of exclusive content like our monthly podcasts and all that good stuff. So be sure to check it out on Patreon. Indeed. And as always, don't just watch us, join us on Breakthrough. Mm -hmm.